tell you what I've been doing just lately, which is highly satisfying. I've been dividing dahlia tubers. I bought 25 dahlia labyrinth. Oh, I, it's, it's, this is the thought is dahlia if ever there was. <laughs> it really is. I start my splitting by very carefully with a very sharp knife, slicing down what remains of the old stem. Take that down to the top of the tuber, and then I gently prise them apart and I pull. And you hear this retching, cracking sound, and you think, oh, good, 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 yeah. But you'll get a natural break then. That each tuber that's attached to that old stem, that's where the new shoots form. Hey! Talking about ideas that come from other gardens, there's two ideas that came from Sissinghurst uh, the last time that we visited. Um, and one of them uh, was a trough. It's a fairly shallow trough. And you know how you see an alpine trough down there. So it's raised you normally more than, no more than two feet off the ground. This one was at waist height. And I just thought, how nice. It was planted with uh, blue auriculars, I remember. Ooh. And I just thought, how nice to bring them up to eye level, to nose level. So you haven't got to sort of worry about getting on your knees and getting your clothes dirty and all the rest of it. Um, and I've got a trough which we emptied the other day. Um, it had the Ophiopogon in it, some of the Ophiopogon in it, which we used to edge the Catalpa garden. And so I've got an empty trough. And I said to Graham yesterday, you know, it'd be nice if we could elevate that. Oh, well, we can do that. So that's one thing. The other thing that came from that garden was there was a stunning planting in, in Sissinghurst and it included a double purple in Patience. Mm. And I wanted to try and get it. And I I did write and ask Troy Scott Smith if he would, could he send me a cutting? And he said, well, if you come past, if you're coming past, you can take one by all means. And I thought, well, you know, I'm not going all the way down to Kent just to get a cutting of it. Can't you just put one in the padded envelope for me? But he didn't. Um, <laughs> anyway, I have located some double flower in patterns for this year, not the purple one, which I really wanted because I seem to remember it was it was combined with the Marquis of Butte. The Pelagonian Marcus of Butte, which again is those lovely dark purpley shades. Incidentally, that's a very good Pelagonian because it's midway between a unique Pelagonium and a regal Pelagonium. Now, regals have the largest, most flamboyant flowers on them. Um, and unless you can guarantee a very good summer, their flowers get spoiled by the weather. Uniques have like a much, much smaller flower and are perfectly good in the garden. And somehow that the Lord Butte sort of falls in the middle of that that sort of um, size thing. And so the flowers are sort of midway between a regal and a unique. Um, and they, they make quite good garden plants. If, uh, but there's one proviso. If people want to use um, Lord Butte in the garden as a, dare I say, terrace or patio plant, you know, in a container, the plant really ought to be two years old to give them their best because the first year they're a little bit small. They need to have that woodiness and that size to give the impact. So you really need them for two years. Yeah, not yeah. something you do every year, but, you know, it's strange how things change, you know, because um, a few years ago I had masses of plants of Lord Butte. Today I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? And the reason is because I simply hadn't taken pot cuttings um, in August and September, which is when I normally propagate pelagoniums. But I found that pelagoniums are some of the easiest plants to propagate. And if you inadvertently break a piece off, which I do from time to time when you're tidying, you know, taking the dead leaves off and all the rest of it. Um, and just making them generally look presentable. Um, if you take, leave the cutting to dry. If you either cut it or, you know, where it's broken off naturally, leave it to dry for a day at least. And then I take every leaf off, but one on the very top. And I take all the little stipules off on the edges, the little flappy bits, um, because that reduces rotting. And it also reduces transpiration through the plant. Then I put it on, on a bench, not no, no heat, in a pot, on a bench in shade. So what I do is I actually put it in between other plants on the bench um, and the plants above them will get the sun on them, but that won't. Um, and, you know, within three weeks, you've got a rooted, plot, a rooted cutting. So it's, it's really very easy to do. And I think way back in the midst of time, we might have done a video on that. So I'll, if I can find it, I'll link to it in the video <laughs> version on YouTube so that you can go and get a tutorial from Alan. Talking of plucking dead leaves off pelagoniums, I find that one of the most therapeutic tasks. I have some on the bedroom window, um, which Dean Croucher on Instagram very kindly gifted me when I uh, went down to Somerset on holiday. And uh, I just love 
taking crispy leaves off yeah. <laughs> when, uh, when they when one or two have gone over. Um, it's a very important thing, you see, though, because not only does it improve the look of the plant, it actually improves the health of the plant or helps to prevent the start fungal fungal diseases and things like that. And and it gives you enormous pleasure when you look at the plant and you've finished it. I mean, I went through the, the Pelly house three or four, four or five weeks ago now. Um, and I had some some pelagoniums I repot completely. Others I just sort of scratch away at the top surface of the soil and I put a bit of blood fish and bone meal in there. Um, <clears throat> depending on how long they've been in their respective pots and things like that. And some of the older, taller ones, there's a very big, uh, tall growing, unique variety called Purple Unique, which obviously has purple flowers, but it's, it's almost a tree like plant, as is uh, Pelagonium papionaceae, which has these little butterfly flowers early in the season, then nothing else. But it does have very large um, architectural type foliage. So it's nice. They're both nice when they get to a certain size in the greenhouse, which means that they're almost too unwieldy to. <laughs> <laughs> have in the greenhouse wait until middle to end of may when we've got some good weather and pop them into the garden and they will look stupendous for the rest of the year it is a glorious thing at east ruston to be able to see pelagoniums doing their thing being kind of shrubs it's uh yeah. it's well, that's exactly what they are you see in south africa they are uh they are shrubby perennial plants and i mean to our to our eyes i suppose to our trained eyes and to what we're used to seeing in um nurseries or garden centres and sometimes in 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 private houses that are open to the public as well you you in, you see kind of see these dumpy little self-conscious sort of plants um but you know if you allow them to have their their head as it were i've got a an old regal pelagonium which is probably four or five years old now called babylon and babylon is dark red and white and it's a very blousy thing i suppose if you look at the shape of the plant it's kind of gnarled and wrinkly <laughs> <laughs> there is a beauty in that and i'm telling myself more and more <laughs> gnarled and wrinkly is where it's at <laughs> yeah well, there is a beauty in that, and, and and I mean the plant is in a big pot, and it's it's probably five feet tall now, and I've had to sort of kind of tie it. And I've got a rose in the teak house um, on the back wall called Colombian climber, as you know, which smells absolutely beautiful, um, and it's in there so I can pick roses at Christmas time, so that we can have a few roses in the house, um, and but it flowers three times through throughout the season in there, um, and I've got it went uh, tied in through that through Colombian climber, so. We shall see how it goes, how, what the progression is. Uh, talking of greenhouses at East Ruston it is probably one of the great uh, sort of FOMO moments, FOMO rather than FLOMO, mostly FLOMO in my life, mm. but uh, that, I don't get, out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that I don't get to see. You do such lovely displays. The glass house that is in your walled garden uh, it's always a succession of lovely potted plants and um and n normally around this time of year you have a load of narcissi in there i don't know if you're exactly. having a, a display yeah. of daffodils um but and they're all labeled so you can see exactly what they are yeah. um yeah. i think probably we obviously haven't been able to do a newsletter for a while because of various busy reasons but one of our our older newsletters we did a kind of feature on some of your your narcissi in there and there are always such lovely lovely varieties well, there's one in particular that I that I really do like, and it, it, it the reason I'm going to mention it is because quite often you see it for sale as a, a one, two, or three little bulbs in a pot, and they're quite expensive. Um, and it's a dwarf cream narcissi, a single one. It's called Candle Power. Oh, <laughs> you know the one. <laughs> and I I I put um, a little clump in the garden, probably five bulbs. And I went to look at it the other day and there must be 25 flowers there now. And that's probably after three years. So I think it's it's useful for people to visit gardens like ours because you can probably see plants like candle power. Now, this is candle power. Um, and you can see how well it does in the garden. Is it worth you shelling your hard earned cash out for? Yeah. Um, and there are some narcissus that, are, that I just can't grow. And one of them is Rip Van Winkle. Now, Rip Van Winkle is not hard to find. It's, it's relatively easy. It's that little short, very double narcissus, which is golden with little green bits in it sometimes. And it, with me, it just peters out. And this, no, I find, this is strange, isn't it? It's very strange. I mean, the late great Christo Lloyd always grumbled about the fact he couldn't grow um, aconites very well. And yet for other people, uh -huh, me included, they do <laughs> seed around. 
Um, the only thing is you have to be wary of is that it would seed into gravel paths. And if you have if you have a spouse that's very keen on keeping the paths tidy, <laughs> the seedlings won't last for very long. <laughs> it is always my aspiration in life to have a garden where there is a shared part of garden, a fence, and beyond that, it's entirely mine. <laughs> <laughs> For things to well, seed where they wish. And no, I'll tell you something that is quite interesting because I remember before Fergus Garrett went to garden at Great Dixter, Christo and I had a conversation in, in which he said to me, tell me how lucky I was because I've got somebody to bounce ideas off. And he said, you two bounce, don't you? And in other words, he meant you ball at one another, really. I think, <laughs> we, do sh- we are rather loud and we do shout about things. <laughs> Um, not so much now, but we did back then. And I think the thing is that the the longer you garden together, the more your areas cross over. So it's not so much what you want and what I want, it's what we want um, and how we see the garden going forward and things like that. And I, but I suppose it's like everything else, we mellow as we get older. Yeah. And actually, um, we had to move the corners for the other half and it was a great idea and it's much better where it is yeah, now see. so yeah, <laughs> so yeah. sometimes I always, I always tell people this is, this is just me being facetious really but I always tell people if you're playing bat and ball with somebody and you know you're so for instance if you're taking a garden seat and you see it oh I want it there no well I don't I want it there and I said by the time you've batted and balled and bounced and bounced and bounced who knows you might even have a garden temple at the end of the day. <laughs> well, knowing you you probably will <laughs> Another building is always useful. <laughs> Designed by Graham. <laughs> <laughs> Intricately. Yeah. Uh, knowing you guys. Um, actually, funnily enough, talking about Cornus and Narcissi, they they lead me on to uh, to Flomo um, because I've been uh, I've, looking back. It's a dangerous thing to look back through your photos. If you're like me and you take loads of photos of not only your garden, but the gardens you visit, particularly East Ruston, they do come in handy for the podcast, of course. Um, <laughs> you look back through them and you remind yourself of all of these things that you wished you could grow, wished you had room for, or perhaps just um, just have forgotten that you wanted and were on the wish list. Um, Flomo, by the way, if you've never listened to one of our podcasts before, is that fear of missing out you get about a flower or a plant. Talking of your narcissi, um, I do love a dinky daffodil. And mm. you had one in a pot last year called Tiny Bubbles. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Little, I think it must have been like clusters of, of three or four or something uh, on a on a stalk. Little, yep. slightly reflexed petals on a very yellow, zingy, yep. happy, just happy, happy, happy daffodil. Mm. Um, and full pot of that. I, I'm sure it would look lovely in the garden, but but really great as a just single variety in a container. Yeah, I mean, there's plants like that that are so lovely, but you've got to know where to go and get them. And I think um, scamps in um, down in Devon or Cornwall, wherever they are, I mean, they are the people to, to you go to them and you they send your catalogue, your catalogue, you choose what you would like and you order and pay for them. And then they arrive at the planting time. Yeah. So, you know, the catalogue, you could get the catalogue early in the year. Um, and, you know, you choose what daffodils and narcissi you want for the following year. Um, don't expect to get everything because you probably won't because lots of them are in, in short supply because they are grown by scamps. Yeah. The scamp family. And so, um, but it is useful to know where to go and get some of those things. And I think that's where Tiny Bubbles came from, actually. That Tiny Bubbles is absolutely beautiful and happy. I saw a um, a little species narcissus at uh, East Lambrook or the fish garden, as the other half calls it. And it was <laughs> narcissus. <laughs> Canaliculatus, which again, yes. stinky, lots, really clusters of um, yeah. little white petaled, yellow, tiny yellow cupped flowers. I think possibly scented, like lightly scented, not necessarily as scented as something like tiny bubbles. We were talking about other halves and how, how people garden. Um, Walter and Marjorie Fish, um, of course, she went to work for him as his secretary, you know, um, and then they married. She she was almost sort of like a confirmed spinster, and they married, and they bought East, Ling- East Lambrook Manor, um, uh, their house in the country, and she gardened, and he gardened, but he had his bit with things, <laughs> and she used to, she used to scornfully say things like dahlias, <laughs> <laughs> which were very unfashionable at the time, as were gladiolus. <laughs> 
And I remember there's a, uh, I've got one of her books and there's a picture of her, black and white picture, of course, with her standing on the on the front doorstep at East Lambrook Manor. And she's got a huge bouquet of Shizostelis, as they used to be called, now Hesperanthus, of course, Hesperantha. Um, but yeah, I just thought there's the two opposites of the gardening world, him big, blousy allotment type flowers <laughs> and her with her, you know, the lovely little, well, I mean, she was famous for the ditch garden, wasn't she? Yes. And all the snowdrops that were in it and ger- hardy geraniums, um, all of the things that probably were unfashionable at one period, as were dahlias. <laughs> yes, you've just made me realise that I haven't factored any gladioli into my allotment and there are several gladioli that I've got on the wish list. I'll have to look into that if I have the time and the, the pennies to purchase it. Well, um, if, so you, if, you, if you're going to grow gladiolus, I would grow some of the, I mean, I shouldn't tell you this because you could, I mean, you should grow what you want. I'm sure you will anyway, because you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you can make your own decisions. But um, I think that I would start off by growing um, for, cut, for cut flowers, some of the primulus types, which are less, the big ones, the, I don't know what they're called really, but, you know, the florist gladiolus are huge things and they're very difficult to use in a, in an arrangement, I think. And they, <clears throat> I personally don't like them because the flowers die from the bottom upwards and they're very good if you pick the dead flowers off continually. But, you know, life's too short to stuff a mushroom and I haven't got time in the summer to, to pick the dead flowers off gladioli in, in vases. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> also, I mean, although I do aspire um, to a big vase of, of sunflowers in the house, particularly because I have one vase which is tall. Most of mine, I do little posies if I'm going to cut anything. Mm. But I have got one tall vase and I don't grow that many long stem things for cutting. So I want to have quite a lot of sunflowers on the allotment. It's very windswept. So the staking is going to be a nightmare. But um, I thought it would be nice to be able to have a few vases of sunflowers in the house. But when you live in a little house, you can't really you can get away with these fabulous stately home type uh displays of big blousy blooms but i mean literally i don't know what surface i would put them on apart from yeah the well table. don't forget there are quite a number of sunflowers in fact i ordered some the other day some seed uh that are that are quite dwarf now and so they'd be ideal i'm I, what i want to do this year is in the cornfield i want to incorporate uh, a couple of drifts of some sunflowers really mainly because the cornfield consists of the cornfield weeds of yesteryear so we've got corn cockle corn cam chamomile corn flowers <clears throat> corn poppies corn yeah corn marigold um but they have a relatively short season and then as they go over i thought wouldn't it be nice to have a couple of drifts of sunflowers to mm-hmm. sort of you know and i'm also thinking about wildlife of course you know i mean the amount of birds i was watching um, a flock of long-tailed tits yesterday in the garden oh so pretty little things you know that little sort of gray pink balls of fluff and um <clears throat> but all the finches um just love the seeds of sunflowers um so you know it's it's a two-way thing isn't it it's good for honey honeybees they like like um sunflowers as do lots of other pollinators um but uh, interesting there was a, an article by robin lane fox in the financial times gardening section and he talked about pollinators pollinators are what uh, <laughs> <laughs> he said he was saying how it's become fashionable for every garden writer to say and that's good for pollinators and yeah but pollinators of what because <laughs> not everything not every pollinator goes to every flower. Some are very sp- plant specific. Um, and he's, he's quite right, really. So, I mean, it is a, if you want to plant, um, one of the best plants, I think, for honeybees, probably. Uh, well, it's it's a, just a thing that um, I, I've i seen happen here. Uh, well, of course, there's lavender, but uh, there's also, um, it's an annual that was used as a green manure called uh, Phacelia tenacetifolia, that's P-H-A-C-E-L-I-A, and it has flowers like sort of mo caterpillars, but it's not necessarily the, the wonderful shape of the flowers, although they are very pretty and they're very wonderful and they do make a telling presence. It's the noise that you get from all the bees on when you when you're going past them. Same thing with Echium pineana, you know, bee towers. Yes. Masses and masses. There's not going to be so many of those this year after last winter, I fear. I was gonna say they were looking quite peaky when I was walking around on snowdrop day. Mm. Uh, there's there there are quite a few that'll be all right. They won't have the same. Um, they won't have the the guts, the big, the huge spires that they normally have. But they will be there, and they will be pollinated, and therefore assuring assuring um, continuing generations of seedlings. And of course, we've got seedlings. But I don't know whether it's a, something that you do. Do you sense that it's going to be a bad winter for echums? Because 
I've got a greenhouse with about 400 echiums in it, seedlings that are growing on marvellously well. We're waiting to put them out. And I mean, we can't with this impending frost again, but um, I'm waiting to get them outside. Or be it somewhere sheltered. I wish I was as prescient as you. I'd have lost far fewer plants. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> the trouble is, we always say, whatever, and it's true, whatever space you have, you fill. So if you have a small greenhouse, you fill it. If you have a large greenhouse, you fill it. And you could fill another one and another one, especially if you're a prop, plant propagator. Um, but then you've got to look after them. You've got to water them. You've got to keep them clean and tidy. We mentioned picking the dead leaves off. Well, if you've got a greenhouse that, yeah. that is heated throughout the winter, you need to do that. Uh, you've got to make sure that it's ventilated to keep the diseases at bay. And you've got to make sure that you do what I do. And that is, I, for some strange reason, I get ladybirds on my bathroom window. And <laughs> only one or two at a time, but I get them. Um, and lace wings and butterflies. Um, throughout the winter but the ladybirds I take off the window very carefully and I take them to the, the the pelagonium house or the teak house which are heated and I let them loose in there um, and if they escape into the cold atmosphere they'll go into hibernation again I hope but in the meantime they can you know they can start doing their bit for the early um, early pests that decide to, to and it always happens you get a few green flower or something like that um, and you know ladybirds and their larvae love it. I just love the idea of Alan walking through his house and his garden with these ladybirds. Oh, no, no, I put them in a box. Oh, that's disappointing. I put them in a... and this I'm going to stick with my mental image. <laughs> this goes back to the days when I used to garden with my Granny Gray. And, and I, every Saturday morning I used to go and see Granny Gray. And I, uh, we had lunch together. She'd cook lunch. Um, and I always wanted a steak and kidney dumpling, which she used to make a syrup crust and boil it in a, in, in a, in a cloth. And it was lovely steak and kidney with this onion gravy inside. It was wonderful. Um, and I, I would go to the shop for her and do various things, as well as clearing out the, her chickens and stuff like that. Um, but when I used to go to the shop, which I walked to just up the road, there was a, an area um, of a huge orchard, actually, full of lovely apple trees. It was bulldozed and built over in the 1960s. Um, but there were wild strawberries and goodness knows what on the bank outside this orchard and lots and lots of ladybirds. And she used to give me an empty matchbox and say, go and gather me a few ladybirds. And I put them in the greenhouse. So even way back when, you know, we were thinking in terms of getting somebody else to do the hard work for us, really. Yeah, she was adopting all of those green methods of, uh, of pest control back then. Yes, but and it, it was it was a sensible a sensible thing, you know. I mean, in in those days, of course, the, the kind of poisons that we were allowed to use. I mean, they really were poisons. Um, were very dangerous. Um, and I remember we used to have um, something called a, a smoke bomb. You used to light on the floor of a greenhouse, and you had to get out quick because this <laughs> <laughs> this smoke. It looked like the greenhouse was full of fog, and it, but it, it was designed to kill pests. It killed everything. It would kill you. It stayed in there. And it was that. They were that dangerous, really. <laughs> Better off with ladybirds. <laughs> I think so, yes. <laughs> um, now, we were talking about changing climates and hot summers and, and cold winters. Um, there was, a, I think, the whole March edition of the RHS Garden magazine seemed to be a kind of climate change special. I did notice a certain agave <laughs> from East Ruston turned up in an article. Yes, he did. Agave Montana with two flower spikes on it. Um, it is, I think it's probably only about the second one to flower in this country. I think the first one may have been um, at Nick Mace's Pan Global Plants in Gloucestershire. And um, anyway, this is, it's, it is touch wood. So far, it has come through the winter unscathed. Um, we may have to put some covering over it because there's going to be a sharp frost. So we may, as a precaution, put some coverings of fleece over it and just tie it lightly around. It's it's one of those delicate operations where you have the longest bamboo cane you can find and the two of you, one with the, one side and one with the other, and over goes the fleece. <laughs> <laughs> and then you turn around, put another piece over the other way and then back again and then back again. And hopefully four layers will help. <laughs> Wrap it up snug. Four yeah. layers of fleece, that's impressive. Mm. I suppose with the um, with the four layers of fleece, you're not only getting the, the winter fleece, but the air between them as well. So four layers, there's lots yes. there to to insulate hopefully hopefully yes <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing i noticed um 
in the RHS garden sort of climate change thing, they were trying to talk about plants for the future, plants that might cope better. And I've always had a special place in my heart for Cornus Cooza. I have always mm. wanted one. I don't have one. But um, there was a suggestion that maybe going for a Cornus Florida instead might be more future proofed for some of uh, the weather that sort of might be heading our way. And they picked out one called Cherokee Chief. Mm. I would like to see in real life before I fully committed to saying I wanted it, but bracts of a kind of deep ruby pink. It was supposed mm. to have fabulous autumn colour, rather nice spring colour as well. Yeah. It did seem like tick, 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 tick. So that that went onto my Flomo list as well. Corners, I mean, they're self, self-seeding self in the garden here now. And I mean, I remember um, when we broke for something or other and um, it was late in the year. It was a... Anyway... Um, the Fosters from Reddisham came over to see the garden. They're great snowdrop growers and all the rest of it. And John and Brenda Foster, John and Lass is no longer with us, I'm afraid. Um, but they took some seed off my corners, Kusa, various varieties. And I saw them a couple of years later and they came in. They gave me a couple of plants of the ones that they'd grown from seed. And they were nearly a metre tall and I was amazed. Um, the next thing I, I noticed in my garden is that they are self, well, they're not self-seeding in actual fact, I tell a lie. They are bird sown. <laughs> you know, the corners, they have these lovely fruits on at the end of the season um, in uh, September, October, going into November sometimes. Um, and, you know, they're, they're quite fleshy and full of seeds and the birds love them. And they go and sit somewhere on top of a wall and, and out comes the seed at the other end and there's a new plant for you. Um not in all cases, but in lots of cases. Yeah. And the same thing goes for Trachycarpus fortunii, the chosen palm. Um, that gets self sown bird sown. And how do I know they're bird sown? Because they're invariably at the base of hedges and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bramble. <laughs> yes. And it's quite fascinating what happens, you know, with, I mean, honeysuckle in a hedge, that's probably bird sown as well because they take this lovely red berries and the pips come out at the other end and there you go. Yeah. Uh, how's your Flomo going? My Flomo, my Flomo is ceaseless, isn't it? I mean, there's <laughs> something I want to, I, I would like to grow. Um, two plants that I'm un, unlikely to find, I think. One is, um, although Matthew Potash from uh, the Wisley, RHS Wisley Garden did say that he would propagate one for me, and that is a variegated... Um... Trachycarpus. No, no, no. Oh. I, that's, the, that's the other one. <laughs> variegated fig. Oh, the variegated um, fig, that, yes! That Philip Oostenbrook had, um, and I think uh, that is one thing I would definitely love to have, because I think figs are very architectural plants. I love the leaves anyway. I've got one variety that comes from um, uh, Afghanistan, I think, and it's a very small growing fig with a very lacy leaf. Don't ask for a photograph because I haven't got one. It, it, it hasn't got any leaves on at the moment. Um, but it's, um, you see, you know, what did I do? I bought this plant. This came from Pan Global, uh, this new fig. Um, a plant arrived in a three litre pot or something. It's a lovely little bushy little plant. I immediately took a crop of cuttings off it straight away before even thinking about where to put it in the garden, because I thought, well, you know, in case it's not hardy, I will take cuttings now. Um, but the fig that I want is a big, bold ficus um, that looks like just like a fig, but it's got bold splashes of yellow on the foliage and the variegated Trachycarpus fortunia, of course. I think there is but one, and yeah. Wisley has. Yeah. Um, but there's every chance, of course, that there may be a seedling turn up somewhere, so you just don't know. It's a glorious thing. Oh, here's hoping indeed. Well, it has been an absolutely joyful time recording this podcast. Of course, East Rustonal Vicarage open again for 2023 and every week, everything is you know changing. What we've, we've got this one fun. Uh, well, I, I just if I can just say this, it's the anniversary, the Golden Jubilee. It's the 50 years anniversary of East, East Rustonal Vicarage or of our ownership of it, if you like. Uh, this year which is which is something that's rather nice um and we have done an uh i don't know whether it's on our website but we've done a, a new history section in our brochure so you know you have a garden guide brochure type thing that you buy a book a booklet and there's a something like an eight or ten page um insertion in that in the history of the garden and various gardens that have been and gone and got better and bigger and so on and so forth um, which is interesting. Uh, we've also got on the website now that you can actually pay and 
Um, if you want to become a, um, you know, a season ticket holder, you can buy a season ticket holder on, on the website. You can buy a guided tour with me with lunch on the website. All the, the information is there. So, you know, we really are knocking ourselves into the 21st century. And at my age, I can't believe it. <laughs> And if you haven't been to the website recently, I mean, it had quite an overhaul last year, drone oh, yeah. shots and amazing yeah. footage. So if you haven't really got the handle on quite what East Ruston has to offer, just head to the website because you'll immediately get quite a good idea. <laughs> and a surprise, I hope. Yeah. And talking of surprises, uh, there should be an exciting announcement on the way soon to tie in <laughs> with your 50 years. So we'll just leave it at that. And yes. we will hopefully be able to bring you a podcast to mark that as well. It all rather depends on when I pop. But um, we'll, we're keeping going as long as we can. And I'm glad that we managed to spend over an hour, just you and I, having a good old planty chat that set me up good and proper <laughs> <laughs> well I miss talking to you because you know we used to be able to we worked together on the radio and various other things and you know we were able to sort of spend time yeah now it, um, it's less easy <laughs> it's thank goodness for zoom hey yeah. um if I we've got another episode next week um, fingers crossed another announcement from Alan there will be a bit of a break in proceedings while I get to grips with motherhood and raising a tiny human but we will return they will not keep me from from talking to uh, to Alan about plants as much as possible so um... I think you're going to be a whiz as a mother you know? <laughs> I do honestly yeah I do Natural. We'll, we'll see we'll see how yeah. it goes let's just hope they sleep at least a little bit <laughs> I'm sure they will. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, happy yeah. gardening, everybody. Oh, yeah. Happy gardening, everybody. I might get a delivery of non-alcoholic beer, it turns out, over the course of this. So we'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, shell out for them because... Oh, you disappeared. I can't hear you. What happened? <laughs> I don't... What, what happened? You haven't muted. You can hear me. Yeah. Oh, you're back. That was so oh. weird. And I suppose, like, um, I think my delivery's about to turn up. Hold, hold, th oh, li li Lily knows. You, did you hear a car outside? I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> my my non-alcoholic beer, very important. <laughs> Lily. Hello, Lily. Lilibet. Lilibet. <laughs> <laughs>